Today, I'm going to take your design skills to the next level with computational fluid dynamics. It's free and it's easier than you think. If you've designed your own parts to be 3D printed before, you'll know that if you get it right and everything fits and is functional, it's immensely rewarding. Well today, I want to help you take that to the next level. When browsing for part cooling fan ducts on Thingiverse, you might have noticed that some have been tested with CFD. Fan duct geometry can be complex, so it's really nice to be able to validate your design before you hit go and start the print. Computational Fluid Dynamics, or CFD, is a process I used to teach my students when they were competing in the F1 in Schools competition. In this video, we're going to use a free cloud-based software called SimScale to set up simulations to help us with our design. If 15 and 16 year olds can pick it up, then I reckon you can too. So let's begin. Here we are in SimScale. We access it simply by going to simscale.com and we can see from the animations here an idea of what we'll be doing with this software. Airflow over this vehicle is exactly the type of analysis I used to do with my students. But for now, we're going to scroll up to the top and create our account. To get started, we're going to click on sign up and then we'll be greeted with a typical type of form as it says, it is free. I've been using this for around five years and it's never cost me anything. After you fill out this information, it will send you a confirmation email. And after you click the link on that, you'll be prompted to complete the creation of your account. Make sure the second box is unticked if you don't want spam emails. After you do this, there's a series of questions to answer. It honestly doesn't really matter what you put in here. The functionality of the software isn't affected by this and I think it's more for their own internal usage. This last one, however, is important. Both options say free, but we're going to click the one on the left, start simulating for free. There are two restrictions on a free account and we'll cover those in detail as we go along. Next up, you'll be presented with three starting tutorials. Here's the results of the CFD tutorial. It's a little bit different to what we're doing because it does an incompressible fluid on the internals of a pipe. It doesn't take you long and it's probably worth doing just to find your way around the interface. The main type of simulation I'm covering in this video is testing the performance of a part cooling fan duct and if it's directed properly over the nozzle. Let's start by looking at what we need to prepare in our CAD. Here I've modeled up a very simple fan duct and yes, I'm fully aware that this is impossible because the duct is going to interfere with where the rest of the hot end would be. Please be clear that this is just for demonstration purposes only. Now this is not a CAD tutorial, but my suggestion for most of these fan ducts is to model them with loft tools. What you're seeing here is in on shape, but lofting is in pretty much every CAD program around. Apart from that, I've just mirrored the two sides and then hollowed it out. As you can see, there's a nice internal passageway and I've done a very simple model of a nozzle just so I can see where the airflow is coming out relative to the tip. Now at this stage, if I was just to export the duct, I could simulate the airflow inside of here. And this is similar to the pipe tutorial where we can see what happens on the inside, but we wouldn't see what would happen after it exited the output. And that's really what we're interested in for this test. To make that possible, we need to model a volume of air. Basically, this is just an empty box with a hole on top where the fan input would be. If I turn on a section view, you can see that it's completely hollow on the inside and the top of it sits just on top of the fan duct. To make this, I traced a rectangle around the top of the fan duct entrance and then a second larger rectangle. The exact size doesn't actually matter. You just need to make sure it's big enough that there'll be room for the air to circulate. I then extruded up one mil as well as a second direction downwards Again, this distance isn't important. I then hollowed it out with a shell. And finally, I used that original rectangle that I drew to cut the entrance into the top. I'm now going to select all three and come to export. Apart from giving it a name, the format that SimScale prefers is Parasolid. If your CAD can't export to this, it does also accept formats such as Step. We're now ready to make our own simulation. We're gonna start with a new project. It's mandatory to give it a title that's at least five characters long. And you also need to give it a description as well. The category and the tags are optional. I'm going to skip them. The first thing we need to do is to add our geometry. If you're using Onshape, you can click a button to import directly. But I understand most people won't be, so instead I'm going to upload my files. I've just selected my file. It's detected the file name and the format as Parasolid, and now we can click Upload. 
Here's our geometry we can see in from the top and we have some controls over on the side here to hide and show shaded areas. Before we go any further, there is a step that we need to do and that is by right clicking on the name of our geometry and going to add geometry operation and then saying open in a region. For this first box, which is already highlighted blue, we're gonna click on the outer surface that has the hole in it. We're then gonna to switch to the pick face, zoom right in and click the little adjacent lip. After that, we can click start. This one won't take too long and you can see it keeps track of the time as well as how many core hours you've used out of your free plan. We have a message here saying finished, which means it's successful. If we change the render mode to be translucent, we can see inside that all of our internal geometry has been retained. Think of this process like plaster being poured into all of our internal cavities. Once the original parts are removed, we're left with a volume where the air can come in through the top and circulate around the nozzle. Hopefully this explains why we needed to model the extra box. Since this has worked, we can now click on create simulation. And what we want in this case is to click on compressible. We'll click create simulation and we'll set this up as fast as possible. There's going to be a lot of settings here. Most of them we're going to leave them on default, including on this first screen. So we have this tree down the left hand side and the bits that are red are going to guide us on what we still need to apply before we can start the simulation. At any point we can click on the lowest one, simulation runs, and it'll tell us any errors that'll stop us from progressing later on. Let's cancel that and come up to our first red one, which is materials and we'll click the plus and we're simulating air. So we'll click apply. If it hasn't already picked your volume, make sure this box is blue and then click on your shape. After that, we're going to click the tick. The initial conditions are how we start the test. Most of these should be fine, but we'll just double check. The pressure is set to this really strange number, but that's basically atmospheric pressure. If you Google atmospheric pressure in Pascals, we get the number 101,325, and that's what's been represented here. That one's fine, we'll click save. For velocity, we want to make sure all of these are zero. The last one to check is temperature. You can see it's set for a pretty typical room temperature of just under 20 degrees Celsius. That brings us down to the boundary conditions, which is our next one with the red, telling us that we need to give it more information. The way we've set this up, we only need to do two things here. Firstly, a velocity inlet, and you might have guessed that's where the fan blows inward. So I'm going to zoom in and click the top face. If I'm unsure if I've got the right one, I can hover on and off and it will make it flash. And that's where I want my air to come in. The next thing we have to do is work out whether we're flowing air in in X, Y or Z. And the clue to that is down in the corner. You can see on this cube here that there's an arrow pointing upwards for Z. And that means Z positive is up which means if I'm flowing air downwards, it's going to be a minus Z value. As to how many meters per second to set that value to, we need to do a little bit more maths. Depending on the brand of your fan, their website might state the flow, in this case, meters cubed per hour, or in the case of this blower fan from TH3D, seven to eight cubic feet per minute. To make things a lot easier for us, I found this airflow conversion calculator on engineering.com. We're going to enter our airflow value into the top field and make sure to set the correct units. And then after that, we need to measure the output of our fan. You can use a ruler or calipers and then enter the height and width into the boxes. Finally, we click calculate and we'll have our values in meters per second, which is what SimScale expects. Keep in mind, it might be a good idea to round down because the specs provided by fan manufacturers are quite often a little bit optimistic. So I'm finished with the calculator and my value is a conservative seven. Remember that's a minus seven because it's going in the negative direction for the Z axis. And now I can click the tick. Now we've given it a way to get air in, but we need to give it a way to get air out. It's a little bit counterintuitive. We're gonna to go to the plus and we're going to go to pressure outlet. We're now gonna pick our faces and we're basically gonna do all six sides of our bounding cube. Again, you can hover over if you need to double check, make sure you've got them all in, otherwise it could negatively affect your results. Fortunately, there's not really anything else we need to do, so we can come down to mesh. Once again, it's okay to leave all of this on default. Our main one that we're concerned with, if we did want to tune, is the coarseness or fineness of the mesh. The more fine you make the mesh, the more detailed the results will be, with the downside being slower processing time and more core hours used up. 
for this part, we can't just click the tick. Instead, we need to click generate. We'll get a confirmation box and we're going to click generate mesh. Our mesh is now complete. On that default setting, it took eight minutes. There's only one thing left to do and that's to come down to simulation runs. It's gonna prompt you to start a new run. You can change the title if you want. When you're happy, click start. And for these simulations, they're typically taking me around 30 to 40 minutes until it's done. So I'll let it do its thing and then we'll come back and have a look at how to interpret the results. Because this service is in the cloud, we can close the browser. We can even turn off our computer if we want. We'll get an email notification when it's done. So in a little over 32 minutes and using 1.1 of my core hours, run one is now finished. So we can click the blue button to go to post-process results. Now it's worth noting that you can export this to use with a desktop based viewer, but the inbuilt online viewer can be a little bit buggy, but still gets the job done. So that's what we'll cover in this video. For most people, they're going to be wanting to see particle traces. We're gonna click the plus and then check over our settings. Firstly, we're gonna show the velocity of the air. The second option by default set to temperature is gonna show what will be displayed with color coding on this graph here. I'm also gonna set that one to velocity, specifically all velocity. To actually see what's going on, we need to click the seeds button and tell it where we want it to start our traces from. We'll spin the camera around to a 3D view and then hiding down the bottom here is the pick button and we're going to click in the middle of our fan inlet. Next, I'm going to space these out a little bit more and I'm gonna increase the number so it fills the available space. Okay, let's have a look at interpreting these results. The first thing we're going to do is change the view mode so it's transparent. And then we'll come to the flow region under parts and we'll turn down the opacity, something like 20% is pretty good. You can make out the nozzle, but you can still see the flow lines. We can see our flow is coming in the top on both sides of the duct. And if we zoom in, we can see by the color change that it's accelerating as it exits the nozzle and the two streams meet pretty close to the bottom of the nozzle. And then if we zoom out, we can see we've got all of this craziness happening here. I think we can ignore that. In real life, we'd have a whole environment and room with moving air currents. But in the simulation, all we have is a box. So all we're really concerned with is what happens underneath the nozzle. Here's another simulation that I showed briefly earlier on, and it's a simple Crowley style duct where we have a 4010 blower and a little 90 degree angle. As you can see here, once again, the air accelerates through the narrow gap and it does a pretty good job of hitting the underside of the nozzle, albeit only from one side. Now I mentioned before there were two main constraints with a free account. The first of them is core hours and a free account gives you 3000. I've run a bunch of simulations here, some of them multiple times, some of them with fine meshes, and I've still only used 1% of what I'm allowed. So I would suggest that that 3000 core hours is actually quite a lot. The other thing to consider is that anything you make under a free account will be a public project, and that means other people can find it. For a hobbyist, that can actually be an advantage because there's nothing to stop us from searching and looking at other simulations run by other hobby users. For instance, if we search for 3D printer, we can see some people doing thermal analysis of hot ends, people testing the rigidity of their frames, and some people testing ducts just like we are, although many of them you'll find didn't have the correct parameters and the simulations weren't able to be completed. There are still a couple worth inspecting and the good news is you can click on any of them to open them up. Once they are open, you can click the plus next to simulation runs and for any particular run, you can click the plus once again and then the plus for settings, and this will let you inspect the conditions that this person used as I was setting up their simulation. As you would hope, we can click on solution fields, and then there's nothing to stop us from setting up particle traces and examining their results. I found this one really interesting. As you can see, the air comes in with a great velocity, but it slowly loses speed, and less and less airflow is making it to the end portions of the duct. This person hasn't modeled the air chamber underneath, so we're unable to see whether it comes out towards the nozzle in a desired way. Here's another interesting one I found where it goes around a 90 degree bend, splits into three channels and then feeds the nozzle from three out of four sides. We can see there's a fair amount of turbulence where the air is divided, but where the nozzle is, it does a pretty good job. We can see that a lot of the air is actually a little bit below. Therefore, it would blow more on the general top of the print rather than the specific point just here. 
One more thing I want to include in this video is a brief tutorial on how to simulate airflow over the exterior of an object. This is actually an easier process and in this case you can use whatever file format you want and for my example I'm using this little jet plane off Thingiverse. When you start a new project with an STL, make sure that you've got your units correct. This will give us a model, but we still need an air volume, so we're going to add geometry and this time select enclosure. That'll bring up a dialog box and we simply tweak the numbers until the enclosure around our STL is the desired size. Usually you need to leave a fair amount of space around the object, particularly at the back. The simulation type is still compressible with default parameters and we're going to have one velocity inlet on the front. Here I used 100 meters per second and a single pressure outlet on the back. The rest of the process works exactly the same way and the results are pretty interesting. Here I've used a cutting plane to make a section around the model. And if you're wondering why the results here are so blocky, if we show the element mesh, we can see it's limited by the mesh settings we used earlier. If you were to make your mesh a lot finer, it will take a lot longer to compute, but you'll get a lot better results. You can also add refinement zones. Here you would add in a higher resolution region behind the plane to see the wake. Particle traces, however, are still by far my favorite. You can use a specific zone here to see how the airflow is interacting. Alternatively, you could run a single row of particles over your object and test it in various places. You could also run a big grid from the front of your object, but it can get a little bit messy interpreting what you see. I hope you agree that while the process is fairly complex, there's a lot of settings we can gloss over and you can get some pretty good results. And I should state that I'm definitely not an aeronautical engineer. This is aimed at hobbyists and you can take this a lot, lot further. This software could also be used for thermal simulation as well as testing mechanical stresses with finite element analysis. If you're inspired and willing to give this a go, please let me know in the comments. And if you go a step further and actually design something with CFD, please link it down below for the world to see. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy CFD informed 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.